Amen. Amen, amen. Good to see all of you. Welcome uh, here live. It's good to uh, be back in front of you this morning, and welcome to all of you uh, joining us on live stream. Uh, uh, just a little warning, honestly. Uh, today is just fraught with all kinds of opportunities to foul things up if you're the preacher of the gospel. <laughs> and so if you want to, like, pray that Tim not do what he does sometimes and just foul everything up, that'd be fantastic. Um, it would be easy to also this morning to just focus on race relations, and that would be appropriate, and there is some of that in here this morning. Uh, but most of the deep conversation about that's going to be handled on our Thursday night town hall Zoom call. And so if you're not uh, joining us on that, you're always welcome, because in that realm, you can interact, you can speak, you can say, you can ask questions. Uh, this morning, I'm just going to give us some gospel hope. How about that? How about that? But we're going to address all issues. We're going to address oppression. We're going to address response. We're going to address pandemic, uh, Hong Kong, everything. It's all in here. And so here's what's really wrought with uh, some potential difficulty, though, is this morning we're going to define biblical faith, and all of you have defined biblical faith for yourself in some way. And so as we do that biblically, it may step on what you've been taught. And so I just invite you to have an open the mind this morning. Let's start with this definition as it comes up on the screen, as it comes up on your screens at home. Faith, faith equals trusting God on his terms. Faith equals trusting God on his terms, not our terms on his terms. Uh, if, you go, if you delve into... Um, Romans 4, you'll see that God defines that as salvific. How was Abraham saved? He was saved because he had faith in what God set for the time. That's what it is throughout the entire Bible. So if you're like most Midwestern Christians, and you have more, listen to me, you might as well get ready to fight here a little bit, you have more Midwestern word of faith, Southern word of faith, Cross the world prosperity gospel in you, then you know that definition is going to give you a press. So be ready to be pressed. You ready? Let's go. What's happened here is that from last week, Jesus has transfigured on the mountain, which trumps everything that we think we know. And he and three disciples are walking back off of Mount Hermon and they're re engaging culture. So, Mark chapter 9. We preach through books of the Bible here, and so we'll let the Bible speak to us about all our current issues this morning. Verse 14, it says this, and when they came to the other disciples, remember they left nine down at the bottom, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Must have been a social media bash, right? So here's what today's version would look like. We heard that you did not wear a mask in Walmart or in the Shekinah cloud of glory. But yeah, well, back up, punk. <laughs> back up off me. Uh, it takes a lack of faith to wear a mask. If you had any faith, as a matter of fact, if you're a Christian at all, uh, you would be like me, and we have joined with other people, and we've agreed to speak a word over this whole virus thing, so we don't need to wear a mask to live. We believe, as a matter of fact, it's a sign of devil worship. Blasphemy. You know, we've written it down somewhere that if you don't wear a mask, you must die. Sights on us because we have spoken it into existence so you can shove your blasphemy. We're not afraid to die. We're American. That's American without an American. And God's hand is on Americans. If you had more faith, you'd just take that mask off. It sounds silly when you put it like that, doesn't it? I would tell you it's enough silliness, but I have one quick line for you here. Um, suburban women are pretty sure that we're in end times because they, mur they burned down a target. I just thought I'd point that out. 
<laughs> Not funny stuff, though, because people are dying in the streets. So we got to get this figured out. But in this scripture, what are these men arguing about? Well, let's find out. Verse 15. And immediately upon Jesus walking up on the scene, all the crowd, all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, maybe a little remnant glowing, I don't know, and ran up to him and greeted him. And Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with him? I'm sure he was asking his disciples. So they walk up into the scene and things are going crazy. It's, it's Bedlam, good topic for this morning, right? Most cities in America, I believe Kingston was up until 3.30 at night last, last night in uh, the streets of Ferguson trying to bring good into Bedlam like Jesus is here. But his, in this context, Jesus, just his presence has changed the climate. I'll just let that sit on you for a second. I'll let that sit on you at home for a second. Just his presence has changed the climate. May the sight of Christ in us stop unproductive stuff. May that be what we can bring to the world. May he bring both the end of oppression and may he bring justice. But most of all, in our presence, may he bring love and peace. You see, everybody at the bottom of this mountain is frustrated. Most people around us are frustrated. What's going on around our country right now is the lid is off the frustration. And so it's rolling out. These guys are frustrated. The scribes wanted to see Jesus. That's why they showed up at the bottom of the mountain. And instead they got some disciples. That happens around church once in a while. Like you go to the village, you want to see Matt Chandler preach and some other clowns preaching and you're all upset. Because that's not my favorite preacher, right? So these guys are like walking in the middle of Christianity here in America today where it's a consumer mentality. And so they're upset. They're frustrated. They wanted to see the man. But the man was up on top of the mountain hanging out with Elijah Moses and the daddy. And so he's not available. There are also desperate people here who want to see Jesus. And they also just got some disciples. And so they're frustrated. The frustrations abounding, and Jesus calmly in the middle of that asks, he said, what's so important? Well, someone from the crowd answers him. Here we go. Verse 17, and someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples, to cast it out, and they were not able. So church leaders go through that. You walk into a hospital, there's been a death, and somebody just get right in your face. I'm like, you could have been, if you'd have been here, man. Isn't that what Mary and Martha said to Jesus when the Lazarus had died? Come on, man, if you'd have been here. If you'd have been here. Jesus um, does some things to for us. He gives us um, some things to do. Let me, do. let me just walk these over at the top of you right now. If you're at home right now, if you're in this room, you want to get some phones out and take some pictures of some of these screens today, they are irreplaceable. Here's three parts of Jesus' ministry that he sets on us to be like him. You can read these in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 about him if you like. First one is this, to proclaim his gospel so that men and women may repent and believe. There is no peace for the internal side of your soul without repentance and belief in Jesus so that you may be filled with his spirit. There is no such thing. All those people out there right now who are trying to attain peace without Jesus have no chance. None. And so our ministry is to bring them Jesus so that they may repent and believe and be filled with the Prince of Peace, yes? Number two. The second part of Jesus' ministry that we're to bring is to bring his presence so that people may be healed physically, emotionally, and mentally. Sometimes people don't need to repent. Sometimes they need healed. 
a whole lot of people's negative thoughts about it. Let me just say this to you. A whole lot of people around you, your neighbors, their negative thoughts about church is because church screamed at them to repent when what they needed was healed. And so they thought the church was angry and abusive. And if it was screaming that without any discernment whatsoever, it probably was. Number three, the undersold one that we're going to run into today, we are to bring his presence so that people being oppressed by demons may be freed. God, uh, in the form of Jesus, is in the freedom from oppression business. It's good news today, isn't it? And I'm not saying that, uh, that all the folks out there who are struggling, all the folks out there who are evil, are being oppressed by demons, but some are. Nothing has changed. And so we're in the bring the presence of Jesus to bear in the middle of very difficult circumstances so that the demons may be cast away. And here... In this passage, we have a poor father who loves his son, who the son needs number three. By the way, some of you parents out there, you may be seeking relief from demons because you're pretty sure that some of your kids were filled during the pandemic, not sure. But desperation. This man is actually in a great position. We've talked about for months now that Jesus loves us being needy, right? And he, this man is, is desperate. He's desperate for help for his son, and he's tried all kinds of sources to find help. He was willing to let the disciples try when Jesus wasn't present at the bottom of the mountain. I think he's a great parent. We love our kids, don't we? We want to see, what's, we want to see good things for our children. This boy could not speak. We know that. The demon, listen to me, we're going to find out here the demon was trying to kill him. Demonic oppression, de demons wanting us dead is so. There is a spiritual battle taking place around us. I, I, I especially know that right now he wants a lot of people dead. He's getting some victory because there is so much frustration coming to the forefront. He wants people dead in our context because we're delving off, we're kind of kicking the fence of Satan's playground here in the next few days as conquering addiction kicks off. He hates people losing their addiction to the health of Christ. That's how he owns people. He's trying to kill us. Satan is not our friend. He wants us dead and he is deadly. Let's get it on the table. Let's acknowledge that that is so. And so I would think that all of you in this room, all of you out there, do not want Satan to have access to the people that you love. This man loves his son. Be filled with Jesus. Here's what we do. We're filled with Jesus. We're filled with his spirit. We give them Jesus. And with that belief and with the filling of the spirit, that keeps demons from oppressing. Demons cannot be in the presence of of our Savior. De demons cannot be in the presence of the Spirit of our Savior. It cannot happen. They have to flee. Our cities don't need more government to release them from the oppression. They need more Jesus. Yes? I, I should be able to hear you out there over that one. I've been thinking a lot about our Conquering Addiction course. As things have rolled out over the years, we're entering year 13. And we have literally spent all these years trying to get folks who are in sin to do those three works of ministry in Christ. We've given them Jesus so that they can repent and believe and receive the Spirit so that, so that they can be saved, but also so that they can be healed and so also that they could be freed from demonic authority, all by the power of Jesus. But let me just share this with you. As we've done that, we have had to work through horrifically bad discipleship we've had to work through people being told the dumbest things about Jesus and the gospel and the Bible over the years people have had to have, have their entire faith systems completely reoriented because of spiritual abuse from some horrific discipleship and I'm I'm being careful there because I don't want to badmouth the actual bride of Christ because sometimes people disciple with what they know so I want to give them grace but that is where these people were. It has been unveiled as we have had almost 7,000 people go through the course now. And you say, Tim, what do you, what do you mean by 
uh, poor discipleship. Well, here's what happened. For about 100 years, the church yelled at people that all of their problems were sin and they just needed to repent. They didn't give them the power source. They just said, you need to change. Do the American thing and just stop it. Just stop that mess. There was no power given, no power source given, no actual hope. Just stop it. Anybody have parents like that? <laughs> like, like, don't make me come back there. Like, anybody, anybody's mom just kind of take swooping slaps into the back seat if you were a kid, right? Just don't make me pull this car over. <clears throat> yeah, we had relatives that used to beat, their mom used to beat them with a flip flop from the front seat. So. Let me just say this, it's not too late for you to join us tomorrow night, by the way. Uh, let me just share this. Some people think, oh, well, I graduated from Concrete Addictions. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me, that's funny. That's funny. Usually, usually folks start to have some spiritual maturity. Penny was it your third or fourth one that things started clicking, right? I'm not picking on you, but I know you were one of those people that did that. But no, I graduated. That's like saying I graduated in sanctification, right? I mean, like... <laughs> The gospel continues to change us. The spirit continues to change us. We need environments like that where we're setting ourselves at the base of the cross, humble, broken, like this man, teachable in the moment. We don't need mystical incantations. We need an actual belief that Jesus is enough. And see, our, our minds and our hearts and our souls are so forgetful that you can get all stoked about Jesus. This music's been fantastic today, right? I mean, like, like, and we're, we're kind of stoked about Jesus here this morning, and by the time we hit that door, we'll forget. You can't have too many reminders. So the Father continues here, verse 18. He says, and whenever it, the demon, seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out. Good request. So, but they're not able. And he answered them. Jesus says this. O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring me the boy. Bring, bring him here. And so here's what we know. The disciples have had some past success casting out demons. So here's what we need to learn today. This, this is where this is going to get touchy. And you're going to have to listen really close or you will walk out of here with some of that bad discipleship that I, we, had to, we have to hone out of people in conquering addiction. What's the difference in the disciples being, going out, being able to go out and cast out demons, and now in this case, they cannot? This is really an important teaching today, if you can't tell. Because Jesus had already sent them out with his power, but now he's telling them, you are a faithless generation. Let me translate that for you. You have forgotten the power source and the why. Let me say that again. What Jesus is telling them by saying a faithless generation, he's not saying like some idiot who, who has had a severe death in her family and some word of faith person has said over the top of them, if you just had had more faith, they would not have died. That's not what he's saying. Let me translate it for you. He's saying you have forgotten the power source and the why it happened before. Later, in his last hours before he's executed, Jesus will tell them this. He will say, you can do, help me out here, nothing without me. Say that with me in, in this room. You can do nothing without me. I can hear you right through your mask. That's fantastic. Let's see if you guys, I can hear you guys through the camera. You can do nothing without me. How much can we do? Nothing. Nothing. So apparently the disciples at the base of the mountain when this man walked up and said, um, here's my son, apparently what they did was they tried to cast the demon out different than they did before without Jesus. Because there is no power without him. See, here's the problem. Some of you in this room have been told that some tragedy in your life could have been avoided if you had just had more faith. And even if you verbally say that's not so, somewhere in your soul you still have some guilt that says, uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. 
my mom would probably still be with us, something if I had just had more faith. Can we do this today? Can we like let that go? Can you like receive the spirit of the living God here right now and be healed? If you're out there and you got any of that guilt going on, can we like receive the words of Jesus and just let that go? That is an unnecessary guilt. You must never feel that way again. Because let's take this text literally and say that for the most part, listen to me, he calls us a faithless generation. For the most part, though, on the other side of the fence there, the modern American church sees relatively little power because it is a rather faithless generation. And we need to pray with vastly more fervor and faith than we do. But we haven't gotten to the why yet. Why does Jesus heal sometimes and sometimes not? Why does he respond to our prayer sometimes and sometimes not? This is a difficult sermon. Can you guys tell? This is hard stuff. But let me delve back into the book of John here for just a second to score the difference between what Jesus is about to do and your well-meaning but deceived friends who told you that that divorce you went through was caused by lackluster faith, that death in your family was ca- caused by your lackluster faith, this persistent virus that we're putting up with is caused by your lackluster faith. Let me tell you, the, let me explain to you the difference here. John 15, verse 7. Let me just read this to you off the screen. If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you. What does that mean? That means you and Jesus are one. That means as you are thinking about praying, you are thinking what? You are thinking Jesus. You're thinking Jesus' thoughts. You're thinking Jesus' will. You're thinking what he wants to do in his power, in his authority, because you are one. See, see we, have, we have had such a low view of Jesus and his, uh, his desire to abide in us, to live in us, to, to be the driving force between our, of our heart, to be the driving force of our minds, that we don't actually even believe that can happen. That we can think God's thoughts. That we can think God's will. That our heart would be so one with Christ that we actually are one. We don't even believe that can happen, let alone that we would so give up self that we would submit ourselves to the spirit that could actually happen. You see why we've got to replace some bad discipleship? We've got to be encouraged that this can actually, actually, actually happen. See, this is what our, your, for, for your friends who said you didn't have enough faith forgot to tell you. See, a true faith is an abiding faith. A true faith doesn't even come from you. Because when you're praying faithfully without the Spirit, you know what you're praying for? You're praying for the selfish desires of your heart. Let me say that again. This is it. This is the hinge. When we're praying a faith other than an abiding faith, when we're, when we're not saying to Jesus what he has already put inside of us, we are going to pray from our selfish heart. He is never going to answer that faithful prayer. He's going to answer the things that are coming actually from him. That's what abiding with him and, and, um, and getting that. So let's go back. Faith equals trusting God on God's terms. And so when he so invades our soul that we are thinking his thoughts, when I open my mouth in prayer, whose thoughts are coming out? My selfish heart? No, it is the God who is all good that is now speaking. So you better hope that I'm in that mode here right now as I teach you because I could destroy all kinds of people's ideas about who God is and exactly what he would like to do inside of you in this moment, right? Because you better hope that these are his words, what he means from John 15. See, what happens there, we are so walking in the Spirit, so hooked into Jesus that we are prayerfully and faithfully praying his will back to him. That that is going to sound bizarre coming out of those computers and those televisions at home, and it sounds bizarre in this room right now because we've actually never studied what he says about how to pray. We 
trust him. See, there's a difference saying I believe in Jesus and then saying I actually trust him. When our prayer life becomes, um, I actually trust you, we'll start to speak the words that he once said, and then he will do whatever we wish. My, let me just say this, re- receive those desires, church. Receive those desires. See, when I abide, my thoughts are about to request his thoughts. Well, of course it's going to be done for you. The sovereign God of the universe wants to do something in you. And so we stop going to war with him. Surrender to Christ, walking into the tomb and dying to self is actually saying, I'm ready for you because I'm done. And what you'll find out is we really weren't very smart. We really weren't very compassionate. We really weren't very loving. We really didn't know how to help the folks in Minneapolis. We really didn't know how to help the folks in Hong Kong right now because we're looking at it. Where are we looking at it from? We're looking at it from from a heart that is deceitfully wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9 says. We're looking at it from a heart that is always going to take care of Tim. And you're going to take care of you until that heart is gone and a heart of flesh, which is Christ Jesus, has now been put in. The Spirit of the living God is now saying, let me show you how to handle race reconciliation. Let me show you how to do this. Both sides, everybody submitted to the only one who knows. Let me me put it this way. Three or four times in my life, I have witnessed supernatural healing. Witnessed it. I was in Wayne Hume's room, God rest his soul, and he had an irregular heartbeat enough that it could have turned out very poorly And I set my hands on his ankles, and it wasn't anything to do with me because I pray all the time for healing. I've only experienced this three or four times in my life, all right? That's why they call it a miracle because it doesn't happen every day. And so I I, I grabbed him by the ankles, and God, I was walking in the Spirit that way, and, and God says, watch this. And prayed in the name of Jesus that his heart would not need the procedure that he was going to have in just about an hour where they were going to stop his heart completely and restart it. And I watched the monitor change as we prayed. And other people who were walking in the spirit in the room said, we're not surprised. If you watch supernatural healing and and there's multiple people walking in the spirit, that's going to be said. We knew he was going to be healed. Why? God is not the author of confusion. He's going to say to you in the moment, this is happening. He's going to say to the other people in the room who are walking in the spirit, this is happening. Because he's not the author of confusion. He's not mysterious when he does something like that. Yeah. I watched another woman with cancer have a screen. We prayed for a healing. And about four or five of us had the sense that the healing had happened. We told her, go back and have the scan again before you have any surgery. Because all of us are sensing and feeling that God worked here. This only happened three or four times. It doesn't happen every day. She went back and had a scan. There was no sign of cancer in her body. I'm not saying this to try to be mystical. I'm saying God had already decided he was going to heal Wayne Humes in that moment to reveal his glory. God had already decided he was going to heal this woman of this cancer to reveal his glory. And so he's put in us, we were abiding, and he said, pray for this now because I'm about to act. Everybody tracking with this? Like, now that faith heals. Because it was his idea. Let's see how Jesus played this out. This desperate daddy and Mark right here does not want to hear about vines and branches in this moment, by the way. He doesn't want to hear anything about John 15. (laughs) Right? When you're desperate, like, like, could somebody just help me? This man is a demon trying to kill his son. It's not his role to figure out all this theology right now. We need to help him. Jesus is going to help him. Listen to me, listen to me real close. Jesus is not going to heal 
until the daddy's heart is for Jesus' glory more than for his own desires. I'm going to say that to you again because like, like I'm running the risk there of fouling all you guys up and I believe I'm right. Jesus is not going to heal until the daddy's heart is for Jesus' glory more than he is for his own selfish desires. Because that's a purity of heart that comes from it being in Christ. Okay, here we go. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. This demon's a little stubborn. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water. Some of you think, I'll think you have children problems. It cast him into fire and into water trying to kill him. Wants to destroy him. Wants him dead. But if you, have any, if you can do anything, listen to this prayer, have compassion on us and help us. And look what Jesus does. He says, I'm capable, but I'm flipping this right back on you, to the daddy. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. So this, the horrific Satan has attacked this small boy with one of his minions and wants to destroy, and as devastating as that is, this demon is coming up against the God-man who has been transfigured on the mountain. He's coming up into, against more than he can handle. Let's, let's be clear here. This demon cannot win this. He's powerful. He's never been able to completely win, though, because he threw this kid into the fire, and the sovereign God of the universe had already been protecting the boy. Everybody tracking with this? Like he, he wanted to kill him. He tried to kill him, but couldn't kill him. Why? Because God said, I'm not giving you permission to kill him. God's sovereignty is good. So this exchange is, is perfect here. A man in his brokenness pleads with God himself to act on an act of horrific oppression. This, this now can be put into any context that you have. You guys are up in Ferguson. There's, ho there's horrific oppression there. In Minneapolis, there's horrific oppression. All over our world, there's horrific oppression. The, the Chinese government is horrifically op trying to oppress the people of Hong Kong today. And Jesus correctly states this. He says, all things are possible if we're hooked in the vine, walking in the waterfall, whatever terms you want to put to it, and truly trust and believe that God's will is perfect. And a confession equal to Simon Peter's is about to come out of this man's mouth. Don't miss this. This is a common man, and he just says this. This is one of the great lines in all of Scripture. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, yeah, I believe, but I don't have that faith yet. I don't have an abiding with you that says I will know and understand exactly what your will is, and my next request of you will be that. Because your sovereignty also sets my faith to reveal the glory of Jesus. Because that's why I created this man. That's why I, God says, that's why I created this man. That's why I created this boy. That's why I created every one of you in here. It is simply to reveal my glory. And so when you line up with God's will, when you line up with what he wants to do, and you speak that in faith, now when he acts, you, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. It, it completes a perfect sequence. Look at this. You would, might want to take a picture of this. The father is desperate over brokenness. Yes? The sequence continues. God says, we are not one yet. That's what Jesus said to him. We're not one yet. You're making a request out of your soul for your benefit, for your glory, for your concerns. And the man says, I surrender. Make us one. You want to know how to pray? You just got taught. Until you pray that way, your prayer life is going to be frustrating. 
Until you pray that way, your prayer life is going to be frustrating because God will not answer your prayer outside of revealing his glory. He's not going to do it. And so he's waiting for us to surrender so he can set his will, his thoughts, his desires into us so that we now pray in that faith. And he goes, bam, let me open the doors of heaven. Let me open the doors of heaven. Let me flow. That's why he never, never turns down a truly broken desire. God, I can't feel you. I can't sense you. Would you move the waterfall of grace over the top of me? I feel frozen. He will never turn that request down because he always, always wants to shower you with his love, grace, and mercy. Always. See, at this point, Jesus always responds. That sequence that we just showed right there, Jesus always responds. He doesn't always exactly as we wish because we still have some remnant stuff that we're asking for there sometimes. But listen to me. His presence is guaranteed. In that sequence, his presence is guaranteed. So if he turns down some small part of your request there, as he's turning it down, you're feeling peaceful because his presence is there. And isn't that really what you want? If you had every desire of everything you've ever asked God for and lost his presence, doesn't he talk about that sometimes? He says, you've gained all this stuff and you forfeited your soul. Was it worth it? Is this making any sense? This should be revolutionizing your prayer life, my my prayer life. Verse 25. There's nothing even happened here yet, right? (laughs) We've just got all this, we've got all this heart work going on. Listen to me. Before you pray, you got to get some heart work going on. Listen to me. Before you pray, you got to get some heart work going on. I got to get some heart work going on. Because otherwise, I'm praying out of my own flesh. When I pray out of a different heart, things happen. Watch things happen here. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. <laughs> hey, something has happened there where the, where the spirit is saying to the whole crowd, you might want to run over there because stuff just got lined up. Things just got lined up. This dude just went go like, just said like, I surrendered. Jesus, do whatever you want. Help me. Pour, pour yourself into me. Everything lined up, and the Spirit kind of said, you might want to come over here right now. This is about to get good. And so they go running over there, and he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse. By the way, sometimes when people are healed in front of you, they're still going to need some, you're going to need some love and compassion and some care. When God straightens some things out sometimes, you're going to need some love and compassion and care because we're just kind of like a corpse there for a minute. And most of them said he's dead, but he's not. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and as always, Jesus completes his work. This Jesus, God himself, filled with the Holy Spirit and all, and just God himself has all authority over the demonic realm. You think that as we start kicking the fence of Jesus' playground of addiction, of busyness and porn and alcohol and every other possible addiction that we have, all the things that we put, food, everything that we put comfort in, you don't think he's not going to send some demons in to fight us? But look at this. We can take comfort because we see over and over and over again that scripture that presence presence eliminates the demonic realm they're coming but they lose if we boldly proclaim Jesus if we actually invite Jesus presence let me say this remember this he has authority you don't a couple times in the Bible there's some cats try to take on demons without Jesus presence remember those were kind of some funny scenes Probably not funny to the guys who got the dog beat out of them for trying it, but um, we need to make sure that it's Jesus that is the one in the authority. Verse 28, more. There's more here. This is unbelievable. Verse 28, and when he had entered the house, Jesus' disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Don't you ask that question once in a while? God, why didn't you listen to me? 
Don't you have that question? Here you go. And he said to him, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And he means my way to pray. Not your way to pray, my way to pray. So our big idea is this. Our prayer life must be full of expectation and belief while avoiding faulty theology, thinking that God is our cosmic genie who grants wishes. It starts, listen to me, it starts with surrendered abiding. God, I want so much of you. Help my unbelief. I surrender. I'm dead. As I open my mouth and I pray to you, God, run me out of this prayer. Run me out of what I'm about to say. We you know why we don't do that? We're afraid of what he might say. How do we know? If we will surrender our self-will, die to self, we can rest in his sovereign care for us as we, as we boldly request all that he is. We start requesting, reveal your glory. If you listen to me pray around very much these days, you're always going to hear this when I'm praying for somebody. Father, here's what I'm requesting for this person is that you'll just reveal your glory. Instead of me telling him what to do for them or how to do it, I'm asking you to reveal your glory here. It usually turns out well for that, for that person because he loves to reveal his glory. You know, some of us think that we just need to pray harder or we need to pray louder or we need to pray in tongues. Listen to me. Listen to me really close right here. Actually, it's a prayer of rest. The volume of your voice doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what language it's in. It's actually a prayer of rest. You're saying, I trust you. At the end of the day, I trust you. Lord, bring good because you are good. Lord, bring good because you are good. Whatever that looks like here, bring good because you are good. How about how we pray that over our cities right now, right? I mean, like, Lord, bring good because you are good. Reveal your glory. I'm not going to tell you what that looks like. See, we, we all have these preset notions in our selfish heart that this person's terrible for burning down a target and that person's terrible for this. He's going like, will you shut up? And just pray that I would release my goodness upon this, upon this situation and that people would recognize that it was my goodness that was released upon this situation. We want to pray in detail that says, here's what I want to see. Because that's right. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. You're going to trust your heart when Jeremiah 17, 9 says it's full of wickedness to determine what is right? But here's my philosophy. If we're going to err, let's err on the side of bold request. Everybody hear me? Stop praying little mamby-pamby fearful prayers. If we're going to err, let's err on the side of bold request. You can, you can pray, Father, could you come in depression? We're tired of oppression. Could you come in depression? Are there a few times in Scripture that God says, I hate oppression? I believe Jesus stood up in the, in the synagogue and said, I have come to set the captives free. I've come to let those who are oppressed feel released. Now, the main thing he was talking about is we're all oppressed by sin and his death and resurrection are going to free us from that sin. But he's also talking about people who cannot help themselves receiving help. I believe that prayer is going to line up with his will. Yes? I heard Kingston. I'm not sure I heard anybody else. Jesus says, come hook in with me. It's not like Jesus doesn't want you to come hook in with him. He invites you to abide in the vine. Come hook in with me. Rest. And our response is this. Jesus, you know I believe. You know I believe. Help my unbelief. Hone my belief into what you respond to. You just got taught how to pray. Hone my belief into what you respond to. That's not what we do. 
I, we're going to plead with him at the end here. I, 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 we're going to do some solitude and silence. I, I encourage you. I encourage you at home. Plead with God that he would so abide with you that your prayers would be his prayers. Let me say this, the person desperate for control due to anxious fear will never boldly make requests of Christ in prayer. Ooh. Ooh. Any control freaks in here? Conquering addiction, 6.30 tomorrow night. If you're a control freak, it's an addiction. I don't have any addiction. Yes. See, we actually don't trust him at all. We actually don't trust him at all because we're, because we're desperate for control, because we're full of anxious fear. <laughs> but also the Christian narcissist, I think that sounds like an oxymoron, but I think <laughs> there's a few of them, right? I've been a Christian narcissist at times in my life, believes they can control this cosmic genie God who exists to make them comfortable and live the American dream. I told you today was hard, man. <laughs> I told you today was hard but it is so good. Like it is time for us to quit praying like the fearful control freak and it is time for us to quit praying like the Christian narcissist. We have learned today what the middle looks like. We have learned today what's effective. See these word of faith folks don't actually trust his will either. Neither one of those people, the fearful one or the narcissist, neither one actually trusts God. Both wanting control. It is possible to be a faithful prayer warrior and pray with high expectancy and not subject yourself to the devastating effects of the prosperity gospel or the word of faith movement. Like, like I hope that light gets peeled out of this and all of you share it like six and a half million times in social media. It is possible. We're going to believe that it can happen. So here's a three-part support of our bigot. This is the best camera shot of the whole thing, so wait till all three of them come up here. Here's the three-part support of our big idea from the text today. One, powerlessness comes from unbelief. Powerlessness comes from unbelief, stated by Jesus today. Number two, power comes from belief, and true belief can improve. But our heart has to be changed. Correct faith can improve. And then three, true belief is expressed in humble prayer. True belief is expressed in humble prayer. God, I don't know what else to do. I trust you. God, I don't know what else to do. I trust you. I'm done with the preset notions. I'm done with what my family of origin taught me. I'm done with what I believe should happen. I only want what you want and mean it, you'll see your prayer life explode with all kinds of exciting stories. You'll be calling people all over the place and going, I prayed for this, I prayed this, I prayed this, and, and God responded. I prayed this, and God responded. I prayed this, and God responded. You know what? You know what? Let me give you an example. This just came to me. This may be bad because it's not in the script. Okay. You have a relative that does not know Jesus. You may have been praying for their salvation for a long time out of a selfish heart. God may not have responded to your prayer yet because you're praying for their salvation for you. When that changes to, I'm praying for their salvation so that your glory may be revealed, and you mean it, you may, you may have some results, right? Right? You see the difference? How many of our prayers are actually said, like, God, I'm doing that. We'll even say it, like, for your glory, for your glory alone. And inside we're going like, oh, I can't wait to see that happen for me so that I can sleep. Here's what happened. God responds. Listen to me. God responds to our trust. Faith is believing God on God's terms. It's trusting God on God's terms. We in America trust God on our terms. That's the repentance that needs to happen. That's the repentance that needs to happen. Hear me here. Hear me out there. That's the repentance that needs to happen. I am guilty. 
I'm confessing in front of you that I've prayed so many times for myself to receive glory. And you can pray for me that it stop. I will pray that for you, that it stop. Because wouldn't we like, in the midst of all this insanity around us right now, for God to hear us? Wouldn't we love it for God to hear us because we're abiding and he can't wait to respond. I can't explain exactly how that works. I just know it does. <laughs> I just know it does. All right, here's what's going to happen. We're going to spend uh, five minutes in here in solitude and silence. There's no communion in here today unless you brought your own. Out there, if you have communion, I suggest you, uh, you take it together, but spend some time contemplating what it would take for you to die to get yourself out of the way and Jesus so fill you with him so that your prayer now instead of anything for your selfish heart to be um, fulfilled that it is strictly you're asking him to reveal his glory in his will can we do that let me pray that that happened for you and thank you for your time. <laughs> Father, we thank you. Uh, I, here's what I would ask God is that um, I took some bold risks there and I would, I would just say to you right now, God, that if I overstepped anything from the text, anything from Scripture, anything in your will, that you would erase that. You, you have the ability to, t to, to fix and hone minds. But if we were onto something there, God, if that's kind of what has happened to us, if it's what was happening here, the reason the Father said, help my unbelief, is he had this recognition that he was making a request not for Jesus' glory to be revealed, but just simply because there's something he wanted to see happen. Can you be, help us be like him with a death to self and a desire to see nothing but you, Christ, the Father, the Spirit, glorified in our day? That would be the ultimate expression of love. We're commanded to love the Lord of God, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think that would be it. That would be our expression of love to you. May you feel loved today, God. May you feel blessed and honored and glorified as your people respond to what they've heard today. We love you. Amen.